Okay, uh, welcome back uh, to Vermont House Judiciary Committee, and we are con um, considering H-128 and continuing our testimony. Um, let's see, next we please have um, the Pride Center of Vermont. Great, good afternoon, welcome. Hi, thank you so much. Um, for the record, my name is Ann Moyer Bralian. I use she, her, and hers pronouns. And I am the interim director of the Safe Space Anti-Violence Program at the Pride Center of Vermont. So we serve LGBTQ plus Vermonters who've been impacted by violence and or harm. And I'm here today in, in support of H-128. Now, before I go into my prepared statement, I just want to say that we heard some interesting things from the Defender General's office. And I just want to explain that the reality of these cases that we're discussing or um, that the cases that have used the gay trans panic defense um, have not been cases of self-defense. I just want to say that I could go through and list all the details of the cases and that they um, folks have been brutalized for just existing as themselves. So I just wanted to say that. And I will be talking about hate violence. And when I talk about hate violence, I'm talking about violence that is just purely motivated on bigotry and antagonism of a marginalized group. So in 2018 and 2019, an average of 43% of survivors who accessed safe spaces services experienced hate violence. From my experience with safe space, the violence has most often been perpetrated by neighbors, landlords, intimate partners, and employers. Unfortunately, this trend has increased during the pandemic, and in the past three months, 55% of survivors who accessed, accessed our services experienced hate violence. So the percentage has increased and so too has the severity of the cases. Based on my time taking the calls and supporting other advocates on our hotline, the level of aggression and fear in these inf incidents have significantly, significantly increased. Um, we don't yet know the full impact of the pandemic, but what we are seeing is that people are in more constant proximity to the people who are causing them harm and also have fewer options and alternatives available to the people experiencing harm. This on top of everyday stressors that are put on by the global pandemic is causing us to see that tensions are escalating quicker and higher than has been the case in the past several years. And we're also seeing this es escalation nationally as well. Trans people, specifically trans women of color, have increasingly been fatally victimized over the years. And I know Representative Small said this earlier, but that 2020 is being considered the deadliest year for trans and gender nonconforming people in the United States. It is an epidemic that disproportionately affects Black trans women who, according to Human Rights Commission research, comprise 66% of LGBTQ plus victims of fatal violence in the US. So anti-LGBTQ plus violence is increasing nationally and in Vermont. And it goes without saying that this is a concerning trend. Um, while the LGBTQ plus panic defense has not been used in Vermont, our state is not immune to fatal violence. Just a couple of years ago in 2016, Amos Beatty, a trans man, was violently beaten to death in Burlington. Fatal violence has, and unfortunately may happen again in Vermont. And too often marginalized communities need to experience incredible trauma and violence to receive rights and protections. By passing this bill, especially now in a time where reports of violence towards LGBTQ plus people are at an all time high, it would signal to the community that Vermont recognizes the increased threat and safety to the lives of LGBTQ plus Vermonters and that violence and hate are not tolerated nor are they excused in our state. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate your testimony and uh, you're welcome to um, submit it um, for our record as, as well if um, that'd be, be great to have that on our site. Uh, questions? Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. And uh, so we'll 
new with the uh, with the network. Good afternoon. Hi all, thank you for the invitation to testify today. For the record, my name is Jessica Barquist and I am the policy and organizing director for the Vermont Network. And the Vermont Network wholeheartedly supports H128. We are proud to stand here with our member organization, the Pride Center of Vermont in support of this bill. And this is really a bill that is responding to gender-based violence. Domestic and sexual violence is often rooted in gender bias and gender-based violence disproportionately impacts gender oppressed people, such as women and members of the LGBTQ plus community. This bill specifically addresses gender-based violence as it relates to LGBTQ plus individuals. So this statutory change has been requested by the trans community here in Vermont as a measure that would make them more welcome and safe in our state. So this is really an opportunity for Vermont to live into its values and stand up for our LGBTQ plus friends, family and neighbors. We do think there are two places where this bill could be strengthened by just clarifying some of the language. Um, and the first place I will point out is in section one of the bill on page two, little a, line five. And the language there is potential disclosure of the crime victim's actual or perceived sexual orientation or gender identity. And this is just a bit unclear to me. So the committee may wanna consider some more language here to clarify the intent of who is doing the disclosure and to whom. Um, and then just the other place that I will mention where I think some clarification is needed uh, was also raised by Rep Gosland as being a little bit confusing is on line 11, which is little b. And in listening to the walkthrough of the bill, I believe that the intent of this language is that you know, a defendant can't use a, uh, a nonviolent sexual advance as a justification for assault, regardless of that defendant's perception of the victim's gender or sexual orientation. And I am not a, a language drafter, but I wonder if there might be another way to say this that just makes it a little bit more clear for folks. Um, something like a nonviolent romantic or a sexual advance by a crime victim towards a defendant who has the perception or belief, even if inaccurate, of the gender, gender identity, or sexual orientation of a crime victim shall not be used to mitigate the severity of an offense by the defendant toward the crime victim. And those are really our only two points on this bill. We're um, really happy to be here to support this and thank you for the opportunity to testify. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, questions? Okay, um, a few things. I, um, we don't have the state's attorneys here today, but certainly um, do wanna hear from, from them on this bill. Uh, and I'm going to conclude with um, asking counsel with Bryn if um, just her her thoughts on some of the um, some of the objections that we heard from the Defender General's office regarding um, constitutionality. Uh, so sure. Thank you, <clears throat> so um, I think that I, I'm going to respond pretty generally to um, some of the testimony that you heard earlier, and I would just um, point out for the committee that states have. And this committee knows it knows well because of the work you've done on 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 the bills that you've worked on, especially in the in the in the recent past. Um, states have pretty really quite broad latitude when it comes to um, defining the elements of a criminal offense, um, and especially when states are determining the extent to which their moral culpability should be a prerequisite to a crime. And um, I'm going to draw your attention to um, the affirmative defenses that the that you've put into statute in the past. Um, if you think about um, those, I'm trying to think of a specific example where you've put in an affirmative defense. But that's when you're putting in a specific affirmative defense to a crime um, that where you're saying essentially this is conduct that uh, the General Assembly considers criminal and worthy of punishment, but it may be excused or considered less blameworthy 
under these circumstances, and that's the affirmative defense. So if you think about it that way, um, how the legislature has that authority to kind of define when, um, when there is culpability um, is reduced. It's kind of similar to, similar to, to that thinking. Um, the states really have the authority to define what are the elements of a crime? What does the prosecution have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt in order to um, convict a person of, of an offense? Um, and um, I'm going to talk, I'll, I'll, there's also a Supreme Court case that I think is um, worthy of mentioning at this point, <clears throat> a U.S. Supreme Court case from, I think it's 1996, and it's called uh, Montana versus Egelhoff. Um, and I'll try and I know I'm not sure how much time you have remaining, so I, I won't I won't dive in too deep, but I'll just tell you kind of briefly the circumstances of that case. Um, there was a Montana law on the books that provided that um, voluntary intoxication couldn't be taken into consideration in determining the existence of a mental state, which is the element of a crime. So a person, um, an intoxicated person was found in a car. Um, with two victims in the car that had both been shot. And um, essentially, the, the person was convicted of um, murder and not involuntary manslaughter. And evidence of that intoxication was not um, able to be introduced in that case. So um, the Montana Supreme Court overturned that and said that that statute that barred um, that evidence from being introduced was unconstitutional. And it went up to the United States Supreme Court and they upheld the statute and said it was really within the broad discretion of state legislatures to define what are the elements of a criminal offense. Um, and it, and in, in making that finding, the court said <clears throat> due process, the, the due process clause of the constitution does not offer absolute, the absolute right to every defendant to introduce any evidence that's relevant to their case. Um, and it reviewed the many like well-established rules of evidence that exist that um, preclude certain evidence from being introduced. Like think about the hearsay rule, for example. Um, you know, there's lots of procedural requirements that need to be met in order for certain evidence to be introduced. And th these, this is the area that states have pretty broad um, latitude in making these kinds of determinations, especially based on um, what a state finds should be um, an element of a crime. So, um, based on based on that case, I I find it hard to imagine that um, that this that this particular um, prohibition on on this type of evidence for the specific reasons provided in the bill um, could be held unconstitutional for for those reasons. Thank you. That's that's really helpful. And um, if you could. Um, uh, send the case to be posted, or if you could post it, whatever, that'd be great. Um, sure, I'll send it to Evan. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Questions for Bryn? Kate. Um, yeah, thanks. I guess I, uh, I think you're speaking to one of the questions that I had, and, and I wonder if you might be able to give some more examples of, so thinking about this notion of sort of there being like guardrails around what can be considered in a defense. And I think what, so what I'm hearing you say is that versions of that do exist currently in, in statute. And I'm wondering if you can give any examples of that in Vermont law. Sure, so I'm, I was thinking specifically of the rules of evidence. So, um, there and you'll you'll forgive me for not remembering the numbers of the rules of evidence, um, <clears throat> but I will forgive you for that. <laughs> um, but we do. But we have a hearsay rule that prohibits the introduction of testimony that um, is like essentially insufficiently reliable. Um, and then evidence is, uh, and again, I can't remember the number here, but I know it's the federal rule of evidence is four hundred three. Um, that provides that evidence can be excluded if its probative value is substantially outweighed by unfair prejudice or confusion of the issues or misleading the jury. Um, so those are just two examples of, of um, 
evidence that can be excluded um, either because it's substantially unfair or because some procedural um, some procedural hurdle was not met, which makes it unfair. Thank you. And I think um, something else to mention is that uh, in that court case that I talked about earlier, um, the majority opinion said that in order for a rule of evidence um, or an exclusion of evidence to be found unconstitutional, it has to violate some fundamental principle of fairness. Thank you. Uh, Bob. Yes, hi, Bryn. Uh, I understand the content and the purpose of the bill, and clearly I support that. However, when you refer to the elements of a crime versus looking at what's written in this bill here, are we really talking about the elements of a crime or a potential uh, lack of defense for the, the so-called defendant here? Are the elements of the crime actually listed in this bill? No, we're kind of looking at it from the other angle. Um, and this is when I was talking about the diminished capacity. That's when really when we get into the elements of the crime. Because as I mentioned earlier, diminished capacity is sort of putting an obstacle in the way of the, of, the, um, of the prosecutor to prove an element of the offense. So um, if you're thinking about murder, for example, there's, that, um, there, there's a mental state that's required that the prosecutor has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the person intended to commit this murder. Um, and if diminished capacity defense is raised uh, successfully, then um, a person could, that, that charge could potentially go down to an involuntary manslaughter if the prosecution isn't able to successfully prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the person intended to kill another person. Okay. So that's, that's where the, um, the elements of, the, of criminal offenses come in. What's allowed, what's allowed into a, into, to a, a jury is the evidence. And so this is kind of looking at the opposite side, not the not what the prosecution has to prove, but how the defendant can introduce evidence that may stand in the way of the prosecutor being able to prove all the elements beyond a reasonable doubt. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Great. Well, thank you. Thank you, everybody. And um, I would like to get back to this and uh, if we can next week and uh, hear from the from the prosecutors um, and then uh, from uh, from Bohr um, at the Human Rights Commission if, if she is available. So, all right, we are adjourning early. If we could.